Hello everyone, good afternoon. So I'm Nuno Oliveira. I'm a software engineer from GeoSolutions. And today I come to talk with you to you about GeoServer and security. One of those topics that nobody thinks about until you actually need it. And then it's quite a complex one. So uh, as you, I'm sure you saw a lot of presentations today about GeoSolutions, we basically embrace uh, open source, and not only that, also typically open standards. During these presentations, I will not talk a lot about open standards, more about, you know, those uh, uh, OAuth 2 and those kind of things. So I structure these presentations with three main parts. So in the first one, I will start with an overview about the system so we can understand the terminology, the concept behind your server security integration. On the second part, we are going to go to the customizations, the more advanced ones. And on the third part, really the most complex integrations. So uh, security system overview of your server. So basically, it's uh, extensible and pluggable by design. So if you ever dived in the GeoServer uh, documentation for security, maybe you feel a bit lost. Why? Because it goes in so much directions. There is so much content that is not easy to navigate if you don't know the right terminology, the right workflow. So that's why. Because GeoServer sits there in enterprise architectures, and it has to integrate with everybody. So typically, you have a default login. Maybe you have to integrate with OpenID, with GitHub, with your custom integration system, and so on. So it can be configured via the web administration interface. We also have a REST API, but it doesn't support everything. Why? Because most, most of the users use web administration. And for the very advanced users, typically, there is some behind the scenes integration with very more powerful UIs. That's the reason. And of course, it allows us to secure data, services, and administration. The, la the latest one is not very well known, so I'll also present it here. So just start my counter. OK. So uh, in terms of security, so it supports both authentication and authorization. So that's a fundamental distinction to make. So, well, I can use this as an example. So when I went to the reception, I authenticated myself, and I got this token of authentication, which says that I'm authenticated in this conference. And the authorization are, for example, the passes for the social dinners. So it allowed me to go there. Look, I'm Nuno Oliveira, and I have this authorization token, OK? So these are supported by both GeoServer Vanilla. In terms of terminology, so all the GeoServer security system is built on top users, roles, groups, data, and services, OK? So uh, in terms of the authentication, so this is about the vanilla GeoServer. So you take a GeoServer, you download it, you install it, this is what you get, OK? So you have, in terms of authentication, user and password. Of course, the passwords can be encrypted, and you definitely should encrypt them. And then, of course, we'll see during this presentation there are extension points that allow us to integrate with more powerful ways of performing authentication. In terms of authorization, it is role-based, which means that on the default user server, we cannot say this user can see this layer, can see this workspace. We can only do it based on roles, OK? So how do they relate to each other? So we have a users. Users exist on their own. A user may belong to a group, OK? And then we have roles that can exist on their own. And users or groups of users are assigned to roles, OK? Makes sense so far? Hope so. By default, all of this is stored inside your GeoServer data directory, OK? Again, this is if you use the vanilla GeoServer, OK? So you have authorization, you have authentication, everything is stored inside your, uh, your data directory. Authentication, user name and user password. Authorization, based on roles, and you can have it for data, services, and uh, workspaces, OK? Then we have a couple of extension points that allow us to go beyond this. The first one are the user group service and the rule services. Basically, as I told on the slide before, right now, the users we create, the groups of those users, they are all stored on an XML. The rules, likewise, on an XML file. So think about it. I mean, if you have even a very simple system where we have 
a web portal, you have your server on the back end. If you want to define roles on your portal, like look, this group of users that belong, I don't know, to this community, they can only access these five layers. So you have to define those roles on the front end and on the back end. So they need to know about the same roles. So this is where the first extension point comes in. You can put everything on the same database, for example. So both your server and your front end go to the same place, get the same roles. And so you can define roles on both systems. Sorry, you can define rules on both systems using the same rules, okay? So, if we go a bit further, we can see here how you can configure a new, uh, let's say, user group service. So by default, everything is, is on an XML, but we can have by default on a GDBC and of course on an LDAP, because they are the most well-known ones. <laughs> LDAP is very, very common, okay? So, okay. So what we saw so far is that the first level typically of, let's say, extension is, okay, I have a couple of systems. They all need to define common data rules to access the data, to access the workspace for administration purposes, and everything is stored at the same place, either an LDAP, either a GDBC. Of course, this is not enough for most systems. It's actually very basic stuff. So we have other two extra levels of integration. The second one is that the authorization level, where because we have a system that provides our own authorization rules, or because, I don't know, we want to build it per user based on the data available on the databases. I have seen so many use cases along the years. So that's the second level. And the third level is when you bring things even more complex, like OpenID, where you do authentication and authorization, both mix it up together between, you know, single sign-on between several systems. So the second part I will discuss a bit, the authentication mechanisms. So if you haven't opened the just server documentation, you'll see about authentication chains, filters, providers. Well, so that's kind of a heavy terminology, but once you get it, I mean, you know, all of this workflow of identification of authorization in your server, I think is quite straightforward. So, we saw in the first part, we have users, we have roles, we have groups, we have data rules, and we have administration rules. So, these are the stuff we have to, to define the authorization to our system. Then we get requests, and we need to authenticate it. That's the first thing to do. And here we have three, basically three steps. We have the authentication provider, so it's a component that receives something and is able to say, okay, I got this information and authenticate that the person doing this request is indeed him. So it is authenticated. The authentication filter defines how I extract that information for the incoming request. Does it come on an HTTP header? Does it come as form information? Does it come from somewhere else? And then we have the authentication chain. Why? Because your server has a lot of services, a lot of endpoints. And not all the endpoints support the same type of authentication. For example, for the web portal, the web administration is a form authentication. If you ever use your server, you go there, admin, your server, that's a form authentication. But if you want to do a WMS request, then you provide a basic authentication, okay? So that's basically the way it goes. So we have the authentication filter. It extracts the authentication information, and it will pass it down to the authentication providers which will try to authenticate it. And this is the interesting bit. Basically, all the authentication providers will be tried out until one returns true, okay? So we need to be very careful when we add authentication providers to your server, because if the first one say yes, no other one is checked and the user is authenticated, okay? Again, this is still very vanilla at your server, okay? No advanced stuff at this stage. So what authentication providers we have by default? Well, the default one. So you provide the user as a, an HTTP basic token, and it will try to authenticate it, and a GDBC authentication. This one is kind of strange. So it will use your user and try to connect to the database. If it works, you are authenticated. Why do we have this? Because it's very common in enterprise architectures that they already have for Oracle, for SQL Server, for Postgres, SQL, a very powerful aut authentication mechanism and they are kind of just reusing it, okay? So, there we go. Then we have the authentication filters. So these are basically the components who are able to extract authentication information. So the first one is the anonymous. It's basically, it doesn't extract anything. 
The basic one, it's basically which will extract the, you know, the basic token from the HTTP request. The HTTP adder is very common for, you know, organizations that have so much layers of authentication that when a request actually reaches your server, there is no need for authentication. We just get the username in the header and we trust it and that's it, okay? And the remember me is a workaround basically when you go on the your server portal administration, when you move between pages, it remembers you and it doesn't ask you again for the login, okay? Clear so far? I hope so. So long story short, authentication providers, they are responsible for authenticating resources. Authentication filters, they know how to extract authentication information for endpoints. Now, we have the authentication chain, which is the component that will allow us to bind all of this together. So we can say, look, for the web URLs, you are going to use basically the form authentication, and you are going to use all the available authentication providers. So if we look at the, the default chain, we can see that there is specific one one for the web, for the rest. So for example, for the rest, it only authorizes the administrator to access it, so it's quite secure. And if you look at the default, which is used for the services, so we can see that the matching configured can be quite complex, okay? So we can, for this method, for the other method. And, of course, we can, uh, we have the chain filters where we define basically the, the filters. So by default, we look at the header, basic, and anonymous, okay? So, so far we saw authentication, authentication filter, extract information, provider will use that information, and the authentication chain basically bind of these together. Now, when you are configuring these components, we need to be extra careful because if we misconfigure, for example, the authentic authentication chain for the web, we are locked out of your server. So one step at a time. Now let's look at authorization. So authorization is one of those that is, as far as I know, and based on my experience, where we have the most custom extensions. Because, you know, you already have some authorization rule system and you need very customizable uh, authorization. In the end, let's say you are read from the database, the filter you want to apply to the SQL query that will go to your database will come from this authorization system. So, in the vanilla Geo server, we can define rules for services, operations, so who can do a WMS get map or not, workspaces, and data, okay? And remember, they can only be defined against roles, not against users, okay? And uh, we'll, of course, see later on how GFNs will extend these capacities. So, here we can see a couple of service access rules defined for GeoServer. So we can see that basically in the first rule, everyone can do everything with our services. Only the, the users with the role reel can read WFS, and only the administrator can do a transaction and create query, which makes sense. When you want someone, you want, if someone can edit your data, you need a very strong, a very strong rule in place. You need to control very well who does it. And for reading, okay, it's okay if the user can, a, a user with a role read can read, but WFS returns a vector data, so we need some control on it. The interesting bit here is that the last generic rule will always apply. So this is kind of, well, well not so common, let's put it that way. But basically, since we define it here, a WFS transaction for the group admin, since this is very specific, is for a service and operation, it will prevail against all the others, okay? So more specific is the rule, more priority it has to be applied. How do we create a new service rule? Very easy. The service, the method, and we select the roles that can access it. That's why they are defined against roles, because the management is very easy. If we have a user that has these five roles, or a group of users that have these five roles, they will have access to it, okay? So, Again, we go for the data security. That's probably the most common GeoServer security rules that are touched by users, which define basically which layers can be accessed by you. It's exactly the same thing. We have a rule that everyone can read everything. Only administrators that can write data, makes sense. And we have the workspace reports, or, or where roles with read report can read that data. So that's sensitive data, and only a specific group of users can actually access it. Again, most specific rule is the one that will prevail. Reports uh, for the read, so that specific to workspace is the most specific one, is the one that will prevail, okay? 
And defining the rules again is exactly the same thing. The only difference is that we can select a layer or a group, okay? Then we have the catalog mode. That's another interesting one. So when, when we publish data through your server, we have actually, let's say, two, two parts of it. One is the publishing of the metadata, so in the capabilities documents, if we connect a QGIS or an OGC compliant web portal, we're able to see the layers that are available, the styles that are available, and the catalog is basically what controls that. So ID, it means that if the user did, who did the capabilities document doesn't have access to those layers, you'll not see anything on the capabilities document. Challenge, it means you'll be able to see those layers, but when it tries to access them, you will be requested for authentication. Mix it, it's kind of strange, but basically uh, you will be able to see the layers on the document, but will still be challenged if it tries to access them, okay? So administration rules, similar to the other ones, is just for workspaces, okay? So if we, def we can define which users can change the configurations inside the workspace. That's it at this stage. This is what the basic GeoServer has to offer, okay? The vanilla GeoServer. Now things start to get a bit more complex. So of course this is not enough because uh, we have systems that want to define, you know, rules about what attributes can the user see. They want to define a spatial filter about the data they can see. Not all the users should be able to use the same WMS styles. Maybe the default one should be different from user to user. So this is where GeoFence comes in. So, well, it's advanced authorization engine for GeoServer. That's basically it. So it deals with authorization only. It doesn't care about authentication. So it gets a an user, it will trust it, okay? It exists in two, in two modes, as an independent server and embedded in your server. You only need the independent one if you want to define authorization rules per your server instance. So you have a cluster of your server and you want different rules for each instance of your cluster. If, you, if that's not the case, then go ahead with the embedded one, okay? And of course, uh, where we store the rules, the recommendation is to use PostgreSQL. So in terms of your fence data rules, they allow us to define much, much parameters. For example, we can use the username. So unlike the vanilla Geo server, now we can define data rules with the username, not only with the rules anymore. With IP address, this is useful. For example, you know that you know, the guys that come from that uh, organization with these IP regions, they should be able to see everything. So that's it, we define with IP addresses. Services operation, this is something new too. And of course, we have now three types of, of data accesses. Deny, allow, and limit. Deny, well, you cannot see it. Allow, you can see it, but if there is a limit rule, so you'll be able to access the data, but the limit rule would limit what you can see. The attributes you can obtain, and for example, even the actual geographical area you can see. And this goes, let's say, from the top until the query that is sent to the database. So for example, if you define a rule that, look, the user cannot see these attributes in any circumstances, if you do a WMS request that uses a style that needs to access that attribute, it will be refused, okay? So, uh, geofence data rules have priority, so it's not more about the scope, so, well, <laughs> So there is, this is always a discussion. What's easiest to manage? Well, the, it depends on what you do. But basically here, higher the priority is the one that will be applied first. So if you define a rule with priority zero, everyone can see everything, then everyone will be able to see everything, and that's it. Okay, so, uh, of course, Geofence has a caching mechanism, why stuff is stored on a database, so we don't want every time to go there for performance reasons anyway. This is mostly transparent, but if you are managing the data rules and you see them not being updated, you go to the UI and you clean the cache. Okay, allow rules. So allow rules are quite, uh, let's say, straightforward to define, but of course they are more, much more powerful than the default uh, GeoServer security system. You can select the styles that are available, which is very useful for WMS, because de facto they control what the final user can see. And uh, we can define a SQL reader filter. So look, this filter will define whatever the user can see. It's always sent to the database, no matter the request, no matter the contest always happen to the SQL query. When I say database, this will apply to shapefiles, 
I don't know, MongoDB, whatever data source you are using with, uh, with your server, okay? And again, the attributes. This is the very fine grain control. You can have known, read, and write, which are quite obvious, I guess. Okay, and then we have the limit rules. These ones are a bit strange. So basically, they only apply if a null rule applies. So a user is able to access that layer. But wait, not all the users can see everything inside that layer. So basically, we can define a spatial filter, and we can define if you should cut the data or if you should do an intersection. That's quite, it depends on the context, it may be useful or not. And of course, we can define the catalog mode. Another interesting bit is that when you define an OLO rule, you have explicitly to select the layer so it, the server can fetch the styles and show you the styles that are available for that layer. With the limit rule, you don't need to select a layer, okay? So a limit rule is a bit like this. So, right, the standalone geofence will provide you a nice UI to draw the, you know, your geographical limit. If anyone wants to find the same for the embedded version, they are welcome or contributed. Anyway, here you provide a WKT with an SRID and it will just be applied. We can see an example further. So we can see in red above our geographical limits, okay? And so if we select clip, it will basically cut the polygon, okay? So it will be cut. And if we select intersection, it will show the two states, okay? So uh, then we have the administration rules. They are very similar to the normal ones. So why do we provide this UI? Well, this is the interesting bit. So Geofence is implemented as what we call an access manager. So an access manager is the second level of extension. And only one can be available at the time, sorry, can be activated at the time per GeoServer instance. So any request that goes to GeoServer, they go to the access manager. They go to the access manager. And the access manager basically has full control of everything. He can say, look, he can read, he cannot read, he can read, but with this filter, we need to check this and check that. So if you ever have to develop a custom integration that will have to deal with your custom rule engine, will have to deal whatever you need, this is the extension point you need to use. But you need to be careful because this will override completely the default one of your server. So you'll be on your own as authorization, as far as authorization is concerned. You are still getting the authentication user for your server, but the authorization, only, only your custom authorization will prevail, okay? So now, I will go over some advanced integrations that have been performed lightly, uh, late, lately, actually. <laughs> so the first one is the key authentication model. Is it the most powerful none? Actually not at all, but it's a very useful one. This typic typically, this one is used when we have to integrate with older systems or clients that are not very powerful, that don't have the possibility to send an HTTP basic, a username, whatever, where basically the authentication is provided as a key, okay? So the, the client provides a key and your server uses that key to authenticate the user and then it performs the authorization. Of course, uh, we have extension points where the authorization key can be stored in web services. This is to improve a bit the security, can be refreshed and so on. So that's the key authentication module. We have the integration with uh, OpenID, of course. Okay, so the integration about OpenID, as long as you have a Discover URL, it will work very fine. Of course, I will not tell you this is one of the most straightforward one, because it's not. OpenID in itself, it's a bit, it's quite, of course, a very good standard, but a bit chaotic. So, okay, you authenticate about OpenID, and then what? So, how do you deal with the claims? Where does the rules come from? It depends. If you have a service capable of providing the rules, remember, you can configure a rule services, so you have the same rules on your server side, on your other clients, and you're on OpenID, and you can define those data rules. If not, you can even create them manually. So, and the last one is the key clock one. It's quite, uh, let's say, uh, recent. And basically, for those experience with key clock, if you obtain the configuration file from key clock, you copy paste it into your server, and you are good to go. And that's it. Thank you for listening. <laughs>